to repeat one of the oldest uh, jokes known, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you. How I'd like to do that is um, to frame in fairly broad terms, given how mixed this audience is, uh, some basic uh, concepts relating to the scientific basis uh, behind regulation of biologics uh, in a historical context and then to uh, pr advance some ideas that I have about where the field needs to go. Um, so the basic ideas behind uh, translating what might be a great um, concept or theoretical idea to practical reality uh, have up until now been sort of a um, trial and error um, uh, uh, approach that has had mixed success at best and um, we're learning more but it's still uh, pretty difficult to go from um, the bench to the bedside and from basic biology to uh, the regulatory requirements that I'll frame in a little bit more detail in a second. And so I'm going to talk about the fact uh, that there are two bars, a bar for first-in-man exploratory trials and a bar for marketing approval, and they're different. Um, not just more stringent, but they're different. And then how we might think about uh, going from the trial and error uh, type of approach to something that is more uh, systematic, more predictable, uh, an engineering approach, if you will. Now, looking at the uh, Code of Federal Regulations is a very daunting uh, process, as any of you who've tried to do it <laughs> will concede, I think. Um, and my advice to beginning regulators, but also uh, to uh, people like you, is that one can apply the famous 90-10 rule, that there are 10%, maybe, maybe even less, of the regulations that you really need to understand uh, and the rest you can look up at need. And perhaps the most important for early phase trials, uh, which I think is where many of you in, in the audience are now, is this citation from the code. And it's one of two that um, uh, my protégés are required to memorize. And I'll just repeat it just, just for emphasis. The question is whether human subjects are or would be exposed to an unreasonable and significant risk of illness or injury. Note that it has to be both in order for us to be able to uh, stop a clinical trial. Another important concept um, about uh, these decisions that we make is that, they, is that the criteria for which we can put a trial on hold are enumerated. This is actually consistent with <clears throat> constitutional doctrine uh, where in Federalist 45, James Madison says that the powers of the federal government are few and defined. The reasons we can put you on hold are few and defined. And if none of those reasons exists, you can go. And in fact, we have to tell you within 30 days, as Evan alluded to, uh, or the default is that you can go. Now. Um, the decision is based on three primary considerations. What's the p potential benefit, the prospect of benefit? This is based on how strong the proof of concept data are. If you've got uh, a preclinical experimental system, which may be one or more animal models, typically that is the case, that predicts what will happen in human beings reliably, you're in, much stronger, uh, uh, you're in a much stronger position than if you do not. What are the risks? Um, and are those are controllable risks controlled adequately? And are there alternatives? Um, there is a difference between uh, an experiment involving uh, an idea for which satisfactory treatments already exist and one where uh, these things don't exist. So what do you need uh, to get started? You need appropriate screening and testing of donors. Uh, that's almost a topic in and uh, into itself, and I'm not going to talk about it in detail today. Uh, you need to test cell banks for um, potential pathogens. Again, 
I'm not going to talk about that too much today. And finally, uh, you need to understand what your product is. What, is uh, what are the characterization data? And this is actually a, um, a, a, for cell therapies in particular, it's very challenging to identify the things about your product uh, that, you need, uh, that you need to measure, you need to control, uh, and upon which you can base decisions as to whether a product is, uh, has adequate quality or not. Uh, or should you change it, uh, uh, change your manufacturer, whether that change has made enough of a difference to make a difference. You need um, uh, data in an appropriate preclinical experimental system. I talked about this a second ago. Uh, and you need uh, at least the basics of information about what the do uh, dose limiting toxicities might be um, and uh, how serious a problem that is. The final uh, consideration is, uh, are the clinical considerations. Again, not a major emphasis of today's talk. But um, you need to give careful consideration to who you're going to give this to. Uh, the wording of the reg, which I made such a fuss about uh, a slide or two ago, is whether the risk is unreasonable or not. And so a lot of thought needs to be given to the indication that you choose, um, an indication that would be um, a good choice is one for which there aren't alternatives, um, where um, the downside risks um, are, are minimized, um, where uh, the p prospect of benefit is the best of all those that you could choose. And you know, so there are some, some kinds of, of diseases where there's a, uh, uh, among a, a whole bunch of things that you might try, uh, better possibilities uh, than others. Um, then, then, as I mentioned a second ago, there need to be preclinical data uh, giving an estimate of both how safe the product is and uh, how strong the proof of concept data are. And the other um, interesting uh, characteristic of cell therapies that, may, that doesn't exist for small molecule drugs is to think about what's the right dose to start with. With a conventional small molecule, you will often start with a very low dose. Um, but in, with a cell therapy, which typically contains uh, um, components that could act as bacterial growth media, from a standpoint of safety, it's sort of in for a penny, in for a pound. Um, you might uh, you're going to incur, uh, despite um, stringent precautions for aseptic processing, uh, a risk, no matter what the dose, uh, of some kind of an infectious process. So maybe it would make sense to use enough of your product to offer a prospect of benefit. This concept was advanced by a former FDA clinical colleague of mine, Bruce Schneider, and I think it's an interesting thought. So. I promised some historical content, uh, some context, because I'm a strong believer in, in uh, the lessons of history. And in fact, a lot of FDA policy and the um, kinds of, of um, uh, uh, issues that uh, many of us get high sphincter tone about um, come from th bad things that happened. And one of those <coughs> involves uh, a very early biologic, and um, this became actually a, a very f a famous incident when in the uh, uh, late winter of, tw of 1924, early, uh, 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 I'm sorry, late, in late 1924 and early 1925, uh, there was an outbreak of diphtheria in Nome, Alaska, and this is a reproduction of a frantic telegram from PHS physician Curtis Welsh, um, who needed urgently one million units of diphtheria antitoxin uh, because he feared um, uh, an outbreak of diphtheria uh, in Nome. And the material was known by this time to be totally effective 
uh, as primitive as it might seem um, um, to us now, uh, but, uh, but it worked. And the kids were at risk of dying. And there was a spirited debate between uh, a William Fentress wrong font Thompson, a uh, newspaper editor um, in Anchorage, I believe it was, and others as, as to whether one should use airplanes to deliver the antitoxin. This is 1925, just a f short time after Kitty Hawk, with uh, minus 50 uh, uh, air temperatures, or more sensibly, uh, a dog team relay that was organized by Governor Scott Bone, uh, and in fact, um, uh, uh, a relay of about 20 um, mushers was organized. Here are two of the most famous dogs to participate on the left, Balto, about which there's a rather silly Steven Spielberg movie, and on the right, uh, Togo, perhaps the greatest canine who ever lived, in my estimation, who was 10 years old when he uh, ran the longest and most dangerous leg of the relay, uh, and his musher, Leonard Seppala. And this uh, story riveted the entire nation. Uh, front page headlines from coast to coast uh, uh, chronicled the trip, and it was ultimately successful. And uh, the Disney Plus Togo actually depicts some of many of these events uh, quite accurately. Now, this product had something of a checkered past. Um, in 1901, uh, there was an incident in St. Louis where a number of kids, 13 kids, got um, uh, this diphtheria anti-serum and died. Not of diphtheria, but of tetanus. And what had happened was that um, the person who made the serum, who wrote this letter uh, to JAMA, and this is a photograph of the actual uh, century plus uh, uh, hard copy that I was able to pull out of the NIH library, uh, was that uh, the, the uh, horse had been immunized with diphtheria toxoid, bled, um, and uh, the fellow writing this letter to JAMA uh, documented how he had performed all of the actions himself, uh, immunizing a bay horse named Jim housed in the St. Louis poorhouse stables. It's all, doc it's all chronicled here. Um, and done every operation except filling of the vials, which was done by our janitor, Henry uh, uh, Thompson, quote, a thoroughly reliable man, unquote. Um, but product testing, uh, sterility testing wasn't done. And so uh, Congress thought that really this uh, was too uncontrolled a situation. And in basically no time flat by today's standards, passed what is known as the Biologics Control Act uh, of uh, 1902. Here is the uh, face page, uh, courtesy of um, the uh, archivist Jane Fitzgerald of NARA, uh, and the signature page signed. This was signed into law on January on July 2nd, uh, 1902, by President Theodore Roosevelt. Now, the point I'd like to make is that in 1901, we didn't know anything about protein structure. Linus Pauling was born that year and it would be decades before he taught us about uh, helices and sheets and uh, the chemical bond and, and so forth. But we knew this stuff worked. And so uh, gradually over decades, a paradigm where we knew that we didn't know a lot of stuff, but we had to uh, uh, figure out some way of minimizing uh, risks to experimental subjects and ultimately to patients uh, and get these things uh, available to people uh, with the best compromise to be between risk and benefit. And so the concept has evolved of, of three types of controls. Control of where you get the stuff you're going to use to make your material, maybe the uh, uh, a horse uh, 
housed in the St. Louis poorhouse, as in the case that I just described, isn't the best idea. And there's a combination of certification, including certificates of analysis from a vendor, your own testing, um, uh, issues related to uh, the manufacturer's control of microbiological safety. Then there is process control, the design of the process to minimize uh, risks, controls on the process to make sure that uh, um, elements of it are not getting out of control, uh, proving that your process works, and what have come to be called current good manufacturing processes. And finally, there's testing. Now, um, the challenge there is to uh, come up with a short list of the, th the things to test that matter, that are useful in ensuring uh, your product will work and that it is safe. And there's kind of uh, a different sense of the word translation here because really there are parallel vocabularies. What um, uh, might, uh, as Evan mentioned, represent a compelling uh, a basic science article in a scientific journal would be termed by some to be experimental research, but uh, somebody with a regulatory mindset would call it a characterization study. And the characteristics uh, may in many cases be the same as what uh, uh, an FDA person would call a critical quality attribute. And if this uh, cartoon um, uh, resembles any favorite signaling molecule some of you may be aware of, WINCE or BMPs or uh, Notch Delta, it's just a couple of favorite examples. That may not be a coincidence, and we'll come back to that. But they could, these could end up being uh, the same thing and ultimately might help provide guidance as to uh, how you might test your product during the manufacturing process and uh, at the end, uh, before product release. So product uh, evaluation is intended to ensure safety, ensure that the product is uh, consistent, uh, ideally, although it is not a regulatory requirement, predict its activity in vivo, uh, and as, as such, um, is determined by a very detailed understanding of both your process and the product. And that's what characterization studies are for. Now, um, all that said, uh, it's important to recognize that uh, testing has limitations. And in fact, um, this is from the, uh, an international guidance document. There is a, a consortium between the Europeans, the Japanese, and the United States called the International Conference on Harmonization. And this is the guidance document relating to specifications for biotechnology products. Um, and the point I want to make here is that uh, the, uh, specific, the, is the concept that specifications are just one part of a total control strategy. Uh, they are not enough uh, uh, to um, ensure that your product is safe and effective. Uh, as put very famously by uh, quality expert uh, Joseph M. Juren, uh, who invented the uh, concept of quality by design, you can't test uh, quality into a product. So at the beginning, you're, when you start to learn about your product, you will throw all kinds of analytical methods at it that are often sophisticated and powerful. They can be slow, finicky. You might need the, you know, the one technician with the golden hands who can get it to work. Labor intensive, expensive, but comprehensive. You want to cast a wide net. Ultimately, you like to winnow that list down uh, to a short list of tests that are robust, fast, easy to validate, Anybody could do it, you know, even, even the FDA guy or the PI in an academic laboratory could get it to work. Uh, uh, economical and focused. And so you would start with products that are, or with tests that are good enough to um, 
uh, allow first in man uh, trials. And the regulatory requirements is um, it's the other the, the other sentence I require trainees to learn. Sufficient information is required to be submitted to ensure proper identification of the product, purity, quality, and strength. Um, and that is what you need for initial trials. Identity is what's on the label, what's in the bottle. Quality is kind of a catch-all, but what are the attributes that you know absolutely have to be present? Um, uh, how pure is the material? Again, this is um, uh, a, a relative measure, and in fact, the wording in the reg is uh, for the definition of purity is relative freedom from extraneous matter. Uh, and finally, strength. How much? In particular, how will you dose? Uh, in biologics, there's, there's a concept called potency. We knew even 100 years ago that materials could be alive or dead, that some, sometimes a product would lose potency, and um, it was kind of considered an all or none thing. The term strength comes from small molecules, which, which is an extensive property. How much? Aspirin, comma, USP, comma, 500 milligrams. Whereas uh, a, a potency test might be expressed, the results might be expressed in uh, terms of specific activity. Um, and uh, a potency assay is deemed to be acceptable as a strength assay for purposes of um, the initial trials. Ultimately, at the time of marketing approval, um, there are additional requirements. In particular, the potency uh, assay must be in, in place. That is a, a requirement. Uh, and um, although in, for early phase trials, uh, sterility testing is not required explicitly, we do require it uh, uh, for other reasons, which I can explain if anyone's interested in the, in the details. It is an explicit requirement for uh, marketing approval. Okay, so I've used this term, uh, quality attribute. The uh, regulatory definition from another uh, ICH document is that it's a molecular or product characteristic that is selected for its ability to help indicate the quality of the product. Collectively, the quality attributes define the adv adventitious agents, uh, safety, purity, potency, identity, and stability of the product. Here the story begins, uh, well the story, I'm picking it up, in around 1535, the exploratory uh, expedition of Jacques Cartier, whose crew uh, was dying of scurvy uh, during their explorations of the St. Lawrence River Basin. Uh, local Algonquian Indian medicine men uh, gave his crew a, a decoction of spruce needles, um, which, uh, which cured them. Uh, and much later, um, Royal Navy uh, ship surgeon John Lind decided to investigate this further, and he evaluated uh, a number of materials uh, in British sailors with scurvy uh, with attributes in common with the, the uh, spruce needle preparation. He tested things that were green. He tested things that were sour. Uh, and um, one of the things that was green was, was uh, lime juice. Uh, uh, one of the things that was sour, well, lime juice also, um, but uh, a dilute uh, solution of vitriol, the archaic term for sulfuric acid and several other materials as well. And it was the limes that worked. And this, in fact, was cons is uh, considered to have been the first uh, prospective clinical trial. And ever since, uh, British sailors had been, were issued rations of limes, hence the term limey. Uh, we now know that uh, the uh, uh, material in question is vitamin C, but this took uh, a couple hundred years to, to work out. So. Cell therapies are even more complicated. They have short product lifetimes. Their stability is limited. Uh, because uh, a cell therapy product, uh, by almost by definition, uh, is a bacterial culture medium, there's always the, si the safety issue. Uh, we don't know what happens to many of these things after we administer 
after them. Uh, most of the time, 95% of, the, of cell therapies are undetectable within a day, often less. And there are the unknown unknowns, uh, tumor genicity, misdifferentiation, correct differentiation but the wrong place, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they are complex analytically. Uh, one problem of particular import is that many preparations are heterogeneous, and so there are um, sampling issues. We don't know how to control the manufacturing process. Uh, we don't know, in particular, what are the critical quality attributes. And as a result, the clinical benefit has been variable and hard to demonstrate. Uh, there are relatively few somatic cell therapy products on the market, despite uh, uh, quite a lot of, uh, of effort, as you all know. So um, another difference is that cell therapies are not like most drugs. Your conventional small molecule decays exponentially. But for a cell therapy, at least in principle, the exponent could be positive. And so you don't know what might happen. Indeed, rare cells matter. It's estimated, my understanding is it's estimated that less than a percent of the cells in a bone marrow transplant are uh, actually participating in the therapeutic heavy, list, heavy lifting. Um, but despite all of these obstacles, there's always been um, a conviction that uh, cell therapies uh, will end up being viable approaches. The first uh, case report uh, in a um, reputable medical journal of a successful cell therapy probably originated in uh, 1829, uh, the very first issue of The Lancet, describing uh, a case where obstetrician James Blundell was summoned to attend a woman who had delivered a baby and then experienced a postpartum hemorrhage was uh, in extremis. Uh, Dr. Blundell tried standard of care, uh, which included um, uh, port wine and brandy to no avail, uh, and elected to transfuse her uh, using a device of his own invention shown here along with uh, the uh, patent. And um, she was brought back from basically the death's door, was able to sit up, uh, converse, and go home. Uh, and in fact, if you uh, read about this in a blood banking text, you'll learn that uh, about 60% of people living in London at the time would cross match with, without problems. Uh, however, um, there were a lot of subsequent difficulties because uh, what we now call transfusion reactions were not rare, and they were very dangerous. So th this um, approach languished for, for many decades. And it wasn't until um, 1903 when Professor Landsteiner uh, uh, told us about the major blood group antigens, the critical quality attributes. And in fact, it wasn't until 10 years later when Ottenberg and Kaliski uh, uh, reported in JAMA uh, an analysis of a series of 128 subjects who had been evaluated for what they called agglutinative activity and showed that if there were no agglutinative activity, uh, the transfusions were perfectly safe, that um, the practice was reduced uh, to a, a safe cornerstone of uh, emergency and trauma medicine. Uh, so that was 83 years, 83 years uh, that it took to work this out. And perhaps we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves for having problems with a more subtle uh, uh, set of attributes than blood group antigens. This race, is, as Ecclesiastes reminds us, not going to be to the swift. So let's uh, fast forward to the present day uh, there's a cell type that's gotten a lot of attention, so-called mesenchymal stem cells. Some people have a problem with that nomenclature because they're not mesenchymal and they're not stem cells, uh, but the name sticks. Some people prefer multipotential stromal cells. Here is some data. Here are some data from uh, a, a former FDA colleague of mine who has analyzed several different lots, each of these um, 
each of these uh, stack uh, clustered bars represents a different donor, and each of the different colors represents a different cell passage. So uh, what one sees immediately is that from one donor to the next, there might be like a 14-fold difference in the fraction of cells uh, that is capable of adipogenic differentiation. That's a pretty big difference from one prep to the to the next, and there are other differences with uh, other donors as well. I just picked the most dramatic one. And yet, if you analyze all of those donors with the uh, um, conventional set of molecular attributes, the CD antigens, which are supposed to be indicative of so-called mesenchymal stem cells, they all look the same. So the takeaway here is that uh, um, calling something a critical quality attribute um, may not be uh, may not be useful. There's a story attributed to Abraham Lincoln. I'll tell a heavily laundered version of it. If you call a dog's tail a leg, how many legs does it have? Four. Calling a tail a leg don't make it a leg. And calling something a critical attribute don't make it a critical at, uh, quality attribute. So let's go through some examples. A basic one is to look at how healthy are the cells. Uh, commonly, people have used dye exclusion, tripan blue uh, live dead assays. Uh, uh, are there things that are better? Uh, what might be useful? Well, this is uh, work that was done at the University of Minnesota by Claris Pappas and Bernard Herring. Um, a slide from Kleros uh, when he was there. He's now at Arizona. And he looked at a bunch of preparations of pancreatic islets, all of which um, were 80% viable by dye exclusion. Uh, and then he compared, he analyzed them looking at oxygen consumption rate, where you might expect, as the green dotted line shows you, a very good correlation. We see basically no correlation. Um, and in fact, uh, the uh, dye exclusion uh, criterion did not predict the ability to um, achieve euglycemia in chemically diabetic uh, rats. Um, these measures were poorly correlated. And for this indication with this product, uh, dye exclusion uh, viability was not a useful quality attribute. However, if you measured ATP content, you were able to separate the um, uh, preparations which um, uh, allowed uh, off insulin euglycemia from those that didn't very, very cleanly. Another example comes from my friend Frank Leuton, uh, who um, devised a, a, a a gene expression-based screen for uh, uh, expanded autologous chondrocytes used for uh, joint surface repair. Um, and what he did was to uh, compare preparations which uh, didn't cause an enhanced um, uh, initiation of cartilage formation and those that did, and here indicated by the uh, metachromatic staining with toluene and blue, uh, with a, a gene score based on the expression of, of uh, two terminal differentiation markers and four signaling molecules. And in fact, um, we found, thought that it was very interesting that um, the uh, importance of signaling molecules uh, in this analysis was as great as it was, four of the six. And in fact, uh, the way I like to think about it is you could take a look at an F15 and get a general idea of what it is and where it's going, but to predict how it will behave next, maybe the control panel uh, is what you need to look at. So to sum up the talk so far, um, release testing and in-process testing are important, but can't, are not enough to assure product quality on their own. Um, 
identifying critical quality attributes is really hard. In most cases, we haven't done it. We can pretend that we've done it, but we haven't. Um, and maybe the productive approach is to consider attributes that are related to the control of cell state. And that brings me to the next uh, portion of the talk, which is sort of my own thoughts about what's next and what's needed. And none of this should be considered from here on as indicative of a change or an initiation of FDA policy. We don't do that at the podium. Uh, but this is going to be more of a, a, a scientific talk. And uh, some of the philosophy is summarized very well by an um, article that was written by Marie Chetta and John to uh, Doyle. Some of you may know uh, Marie as, uh, uh, for a while, the scientific director of CIRM. Um, uh, and they wrote this concept paper in science now quite some time ago, basically uh, pointing out that um, one could uh, apply concepts of uh, the subdiscipline of engineering called control theory to an analysis of a cell state. And so um, the idea is that uh, whatever it is that's controlling cell state has to, has to uh, be consistent with experimental embryology, um, uh, must accommodate uh, biological variability, and must be consistent with known biochemistry. And that actually t will take you a fair distance, as I hope to convince you in a second. Now, I'm sure everyone has seen a version of this slide, and even, even the FDA guy has a, a Waddington slide. And what I'm compelled by is that this well-accepted uh, concept of discrete cell-by-cell -cell, uh, um, progression through various differentiation states is sequential, it's categorical, all or none, and it's mutually exclusive. And so the, the, the trick is how do you explain that? And um, a group uh, now, I guess eight years ago, no, 12 years ago, maybe uh, approximately, was able to uh, um, construct a, a set of ordinary uh, differential equations that basically, with appropriate parameters, uh, predict Waddington-like behavior. Um, and uh, this ability depends on a concept known as bistability. Classic paper now from uh, the uh, um, uh, Farrell group at Stanford uh, compared w what you get when you look at a population average uh, analysis of MAP kinase phosphorylation, where you grind up the cells and do a Western blot for the phosphoform. Uh, uh, as a function of progesterone concentration with what happens if you do a cell-by-cell -cell analysis. And these are uh, xenopus oocytes, and you can, xenopus oocytes are so big, they're about a millimeter, that you can do a Western blot in duplicate on a single cell. And so this is an ideal system for this. And what they found is that even if they used closely graded concentrations of progesterone, you either got uh, all cells with 0% uh, phosphorylation or a slowly increasing number of cells with 100% phosphorylation. The uh, phosphorylation level in any particular cell was either basal or was fully induced. It's on or it's off. A conceptual way to look at this is suppose you did a Western blot or a conventional PCR with a uh, population average, grind up the cells, and assay them, you would get this sort of graded pattern of band intensity. And if you um, used um, a uh, um, uh, cell by cell approach, all the cells would look the same and they would all be responding similarly. But, uh, uh, and that would be a situation where there was not much heterogeneity in response. But you would get something that looked very much like this graded band intensity pattern in another scenario where you had all or none cells, but just more and more of them as uh, the concentration increased. And this is the concept of, of bistability. 
where uh, cells are either on or off. And this opened the door to the application of several different disciplines uh, that where there's, in my view, a convergence of developmental biology, chemical engineering, control theory, machine learning, computational biology, and cell biology into a, a relatively recent um, discipline now called systems biology, the icon of which is sort of the so-called hairball, uh, which in the minds of some pre predicts a rather, or provokes a rather negative reaction. Um, and those of you who are familiar with cats will understand this cartoon. Um, but what systems, what, why people uh, object to this idea uh, has to do with the concept that many have of what systems biology is, where you just throw, like Jackson Pollock, a lot of stuff against the wall and see what you get. And that's not what it is at all. Uh, it's based on a, a number of other concepts. Concept of emergence, what is bistability, which we've just talked about. What is a basin of attraction? What is a state vector? Why does that help us? Does that have anything to do with the industrial principle of a design space as outlined in, an, in another ICH document? Maybe it will simplify some of the problems that uh, uh, we um, uh, encounter uh, either during product development or sometimes post-approval. So as I said a few slides ago, what's next and what's needed? The concept of emergence is really the central, I think, core of uh, systems biology. If I show you an equation that's written like this, uh, um, many of you trained the way I was uh, in the life sciences would, would uh, um, have our eyes glaze over and want to be somewhere else. Um, and uh, you know, I'm totally sympathetic to that. I tried to, um, given my own mathematical uh, uh, talents, choose a field that wouldn't make me have to mess with this sort of stuff, and it didn't work. Um, and so if I change this sli same equation slightly to this form, well, you've all seen this. And this is uh, Lenar uh, Michaelis and Maud Menton. And my point here is that uh, this familiar equation uh, describes behavior um, of a continuous response, a, rectangu a rectangular hyperbola. But what if you, uh, and each part by itself, uh, uh, obeys familiar math. But what if you combine different parts? Well, what you get, and I'm not going to go through all the math, so you can relax, uh, is that the, whole, the behavior of the whole is qualitatively different than the sum of the parts. A continuous response, like this one, uh, becomes essentially discontinuous. If you simply alter certain of the parameters uh, describing the behavior of your system. And there are, uh, uh, it turns out, there are four so called bistable network motifs. And again, I'm not going to go into detail there uh, except to take you through one example. So, uh, as I said, it's not that they're greater, it's that they're different. So here's an example to illustrate the next concept I mentioned, the so-called basin of attraction. Um, suppose we have a uh, situation here where there is some kind of a stimulus that uh, 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 can activate a gene, a gene expression, and uh, ultimately the result is that a protein is produced. There is a degradation uh, uh, process, but there's also a, feed, a positive feedback. Uh, this is formally equivalent to the uh, familiar LAC operon that we all had as undergraduates, I think. And so what you can think about, if first we consider this degradation process, because it's the easiest, it's a simple first order, and the, the rate of degradation is, is simply linear. The uh, synthesis process depends on a number of parameters, and so it's more complex, 
But note that there are a couple of places here, here, and here where the curves cross. These are so-called steady states. One of them is unstable. If you go away in either direction, uh, uh, then that process is likely to accelerate. But two of them uh, are stable. And so if you're in this area uh, of um, parameters, there will be a convergence toward this steady state. If you're down here, convergence toward this steady state. And in between, there's a boundary. On this side, if, any, if you are anywhere on this side of the boundary, the system will converge there to that so-called basin of attraction. On this side, the convergence will be here. Now, if you increase the strength of the stimulus, the whole curve shifts up. So there's really no way backwards. This is considered by systems biologists to be the explanation for the famous Waddington cartoon. And importantly, uh, there are several uh, signaling pathways which are under this kind of bistable control, so you can uh, project this behavior into several dimensions. How many dimensions? Well, we don't know. Um, probably not that many. Probably a manageable number. That's, that's the idea. And that is what one of the most important uh, experimental topics, I think, remaining to be addressed. And so another way to, to uh, diagram this behavior is that in a certain regime of stimuli, of stimuli uh, the response is relatively slight. But when you reach a certain threshold, the response becomes discontinuous. And the way back is not the way forward until whatever is causing uh, the stimulus uh, is removed from the system. And the lac operon would simply be lactose that was removed. So the takeaway then is that there are cell states which are quantized, all or none, abrupt jumps, and they oscillate around a stable equilibrium. As uh, when I was talking about this with uh, Don Ingber, who is the founding director of the VIS Institute for Biological Engineering, uh, he wanted me to make sure that everyone at the FDA understood that almost all that's important in biology is discontinuous. And uh, um, I think he's right about that. So again, this uh, brings us back to the uh, experiment I showed you previously and raises the question, can you do this in mammalian cells, not one millimeter uh, wide xenophus oocytes? And the answer obviously is yes. There are a couple of techniques. One is called single cell PCR, as I'm sure many of you know, that allow uh, profiling of single cells um, and basically lead you to the conclusion that, yeah, there is all or none expression, cell by cell, for a whole lot of things. Uh, there are some kinds of transcripts where all the cells are expressing all the time and others where it's variable. So, um, uh, and you know, this kind of an experiment is one where um, uh, each row is a control for the other rows, each column is a control for the other columns, so it's actually a fairly robust form of analysis. Uh, put in other terms, you can think of each cell as uh, a digital uh, signal processor that does um, signal pathway by signal pathway analog to digital conversion. And um, uh, I uh, was interested in, in thinking about this myself, but came to recognize that I'd been anticipated by many years by Martin Rodbell. Uh, who, uh, by another interesting coincidence, uh, took political science when he was an undergraduate from my dad uh, at Hopkins. Uh, 
Um, and I think this is actually what's happening. And if you uh, do a heat map, uh, just looking at BMP gene expression in, in uh, some, M some cells, you get uh, basically what kind of looks like a uh, uh, all or none projection of, of the expression of various of these BMPs. Um, and so you can think about this as a multi-position switch uh, with several positions. This is um, uh, a kind of a switch that no longer uh, exists that you used to need to set to get your printer to work on a particular computer. Or in, in more mathematical terms, um, what Leroy Hood calls uh, uh, quantized cell states, um, you can think of representing the state of a cell uh, the same way that uh, a physicist might represent spin states uh, in an iron atom, uh, but with um, uh, the on or off uh, characteristic of various signaling pathways. Again, I've just put a few arbitrarily that are uh, among my favorites, along with a, a spatial term. So the trick will be to figure out what is the subset what are the coefficient, the weighting coefficients? And if you can do that, well, then maybe you've taken a giant step in identifying what's critical um, uh, about um, how to test your product. So in fact, um, what you can find out by doing these sorts of analyses is that, yeah, there are uh, certain kinds of transcripts here, uh, gap DH and ornithine decarboxylase, all the cells are expressing all the time. Um, others where um, there is so-called bimodal distribution where some cells are expressing, some are not. And there are uh, some transcripts where um, if you did a population average assay, you might not be able to detect, say, nanog, which is expressed, as it turns out, in only a few cells. Um, uh, but by single cell analysis, those cells are detectable, and those transcripts are detectable in those cells easily. Uh, to take one of these genes and look at it in more detail with just a conventional histogram, there is uh, a range of expression where there is variability. There's an intermediate um, level, and then there is a, a level of zero where there is absolutely no expression. So um, this brings us to um, the twin points of detectability of the rare cells uh, and the fact that variability has to be uh, accommodated um, by any mo theoretical model that we come up with. And that is why I, I feel that the concept of basins of attraction is so important, that you have sort of a catcher's mitt uh, within which particular levels of mRNA within a cell are all consistent with a particular cell state. And you have to apply a perturbation great enough to knock the ball out of the glove to get into a different state. So to illustrate this a little bit further, if you do conventional population average um, uh, PCR on several of our favorite stem cell related genes, uh, basically the transcripts are undetectable. But for single cells, uh, in those cells, uh, the, the signal is well above the threshold. And so the concept then is that if the gene is expressed in a cell at all, um, maybe that's all that matters. The, le the mean level um, is relatively constant. So there are transcripts which um, uh, are expressed in all the cells all the time. These are the so-called unimodal genes. Then there are transcripts which are expressed bimodally. And what's fascinating to me is that this range is relatively small, that um, 
There aren't great differences from one cell to the next or one uh, sample to the next uh, or even one transcript to the next uh, in the mean level of RNA per cell. But for the um, uh, unimodal genes, which are, tend to be things which are related to the sort of end, up, end effector functions of the cell, there can be a, a great deal of variation depending on the functional needs of the cell. So the idea is that from a mixture of various subpopulations, here my ones and zeros from the previous slide are represented by red or, or green dots, um, you would first group and count, uh, and then differences between one preparation and another would simply depend on the relative sizes uh, of the different uh, groups. The next uh, challenge then is what are the different cell types? What makes them different? Um, and does it matter? Well, I think the answer is obviously yes, and I'll give you an example. Um, some uh, friends of mine, uh, Sally Temple and Jeff Stern and their colleagues, are working on a therapy for um, uh, um, a retinal dystrophy, macular degeneration, and they've been using uh, a well-understood uh, model, the Royal College of Surgeons RAT, which um, is a quantitative and precise model of retinal dystrophy. It's not really macular degeneration. It's a mutation in a tyrosine kinase and receptor kinase um, that causes effects similar to what happens in macular degeneration, uh, uh, ending in the loss of the retinal pigment epithelium uh, and ultimately blindness. Um, they have um, a number of different preparations. But if you compare two of them, one outperforms the other in a very precise uh, assay, uh, which I'll describe in a second. Uh, and so there is biological evidence that there may be different uh, subpopulations. Can we find molecular attribute sets that discriminate between them? And so what you do is you grow this, the cells for a number of different uh, lengths of time and inject them subretinally. And what you find is that um, uh, on the left are the uh, controls, on the right are the um, uh, injected, that uh, uh, the wild type um, uh, retinas have an ample uh, so-called outer nuclear layer, but it's missing in the uh, RCS rats. Um, by DAPI staining, this is confirmed. And if you um, uh, now um, inject with their preparation, you restore outer nuclear uh, layer. The control, the outer nuclear layer is still missing. And more importantly, um, if you do a, a, a preclinical evaluation where you take a rat and you put it on a turntable and you um, turn the, and you s expose the rat to a pattern of vertical bars, the um, ability of the rat to track, tr the, the rat will, eyes will track by reflex until the bars are so finely spaced that the uh, rats can't resolve the bars. Uh, and at that level, the rat is deemed to be blind. And uh, the um, appropriate preparation, the four-week preparation, restores vision almost to control levels denoted by the red line. We found when we analyzed some of these cells that if we looked at uh, cells at two weeks um, um, and four weeks, there was a cluster where some of the, the uh, uh, two- and four-week cells red and blue uh, clustered together, but that at uh, four weeks, a new cluster appeared. Uh, and we speculate that it is these cells that are doing the uh, therapeutic heavy lifting uh, to um, 
confer the improvement in, in visual acuity. Um, so the concept, and this is, seems also to be the case for uh, uh, um, human clinical therapies such as uh, expanded autologous uh, chondrocytes, is that um, if there were a sort of graded effect uh, between untreated uh, or uh, uh, treated uh, subjects, you would see um, uh, some subjects with a marginal effect. But in fact, that's not what you see. You see patients who are subjects who um, are not uh, uh, improved at all, but mostly you see patients where there is a basically a complete cure, a full um, restoration of function. So what uh, I would like to suggest is that the clinical benefit will depend on the number of cells in the correct discrete state. Um, this idea is closely related to a concept developed by the developmental biologist uh, John Gurdon, who described in 1988 a phenomenon known as the community effect, basically that for good or ill, a certain number of cells had to be clumped together in order for a transition to occur. Below that, nothing happened. Above that, something happened. In Professor Gurdon's uh, paper, this was muscle formation, but there are data, for example, from uh, the former Geron uh, uh, company working on uh, an embryonic stem cell derived therapy. Above a certain sharp threshold, tumor formation occurred. Below it, there was no tumor formation. And it was not a graded effect, it was a sharp threshold effect. Um, some years, quite a few years later, in 2010, uh, arguably one of the most um, well-known computational systems biology labs, that of Eric Davidson, uh, uh, released a paper suggesting that this effect was also a case of bistable regulation. Um, so the goal then becomes to identify state vectors that specify tractor basins corresponding to desired process intermediates or final product unambiguously. Um, in other words, the cell state can be analyzed by interrogating status of signal pathways that dominate the state vector and that these cells will tend toward stable equilibrium state from anywhere in the basin. So how do we get from where we are to where we need to be? Basically, better math, recast the problem, in my opinion, a signal uh, transduction uh, problem embedded in a bioinformatic classification problem, and better wet bench methods that have uh, a greater sensitivity and discriminating power. Uh, the implications, as I see it, for cell therapy is, first of all, if we can um, uh, s selectively identify the proper cells and pull them out and get rid of the bad cells, what, we will happen, uh, what will happen is that we would magnify a treatment effect. Uh, at a minimum, if there is less product-related activity, um, variability, the um, differences between the two will be um, um, crisper and cleaner, and the aggregate of these two effects is that the effective power of a clinical trial will be increased. Uh, mathematically tractable models uh, based on all or none uh, phenomena uh, will uh, allow uh, more facile computations and ultimately lead to this to use of exploitation of the concept of design space uh, using quality by design principles to improve process design and control uh, and in-process and release testing. So we see ultimately an idea where um, uh, the state, the cells will move through, from regions of homeostasis through regions of bistability uh, through one process step to the next, uh, a set of sequential um, attractors uh, from one design space to the next to the next, ultimately uh, a final end state. So to summarize this once more, one more time, 
Uh, I will uh, conclude and, and uh, be delighted to field questions. I will acknowledge um, all of my uh, collaborators, current and, and former. And uh, if you want to uh, contact me subsequently, you are welcome to do so, and here is all my uh, contact information. Thank you for your attention, and uh, um, I'm at your disposal now. Yeah, so um, as you probably know, I think that uh, using gene expression um, or characteristics of genes to predict the fate of cells after transplant is really important. Yeah, I, I knew I was preaching to the choir in your case, Jean. <laughs> yeah, so, so one of the things we've realized recently, though, is there's certain, I mean, this is sort of like the attractor. It's not really, but it's sort of like that. We found that certain transcription factors, and specifically one called REST, which is a repressor, it's critical that, and it turns, it turns off a whole suite of genes that are involved in neural development. And we didn't know that REST was involved. We saw the evidence that it was involved by looking at that of the genes that were down-regulated and then up-regulated when the cells became neurons. So I think we can simplify a lot of these um, assessments by exactly. discovering like the most important part of the gene expression profile. Well, that, that was essentially. Um, uh, I was actually uh, talking with some folks uh, earlier uh, about this that um, the problem is, can be likened to those magic eye uh, um, things that were popular a few years ago. That there's this massive information, and how do you sort? How do you pull out what matters? That's that is what I am getting at with the idea of a signal transduction uh, problem embedded in a classification problem, or maybe it's the other way around. My bias is that we need to identify the um, signal transduction pathways, the whole module and interrogate those, and that there will probably be just a few of them. Um, my guess would be between a half a dozen and a dozen and a half at most that really matter. Um, uh, uh, Eric Davidson um, told me that he thought you had to spell out every transcript, and I, I don't think so. I think you are right that, um, that now the trick is to figure out what matters. And the next trick will be to figure out um, by how much. How much of a difference makes a difference. Uh, and and if, if you can stay within those limits, within the boundary of the attractor, then that may be all you need to do. Or within using standard um, you know, quality systems uh, criteria for reliably within. We see this as a, we call it the sweet spot. Hmm? We call this a sweet spot where uh, there's a, a certain gene expression profile that, that predicts that yeah. the cells will go on and do something that we want them to do yeah. or not. I mean, that is, that is basically the attractor basin concept. And, and the thing I like about it is that, um, um, very simple, rel well, by, if you are a mathematician, very simple math uh, would predict this. Uh, that, you know, you're just using the michaelis menten equation, or several of them, and, and this behavior falls right out of that from first principles. So much of what you're discussing seems to be very cell intrinsic. Um, and what about the cell, you know, extrinsic um, activity per, you know, as you put these into patients, and what I'm specifically getting at is, um, you know, and Gene might want to weigh in, autologous versus allogeneic cell therapies, right, where you have different immune compatibility, and what does that mean for, you know, whether it's the cell states or how the cells are going to react, or, you know, more pertinent safety and, and so on of the, the cells. So I think the um, I think the transplantation immunology question is completely separate. Um, 
Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand your question, so I'm, I'm So my guessing. question is to get to, and, and we're going to meet later, right? So I develop, I'll say, IPS drive cell therapies in case cells that are allogeneic. Mm -hmm. And does the genetic profile, so a lot of the questions is, you know, of those IPS cells, um, you know, what's the resolution of the genetic profile, do you want to know, and are there safety concerns? So you could have translocations or mutations that might be a concern in an autologous product that I would say in an allogeneic product that is destined, um, in the case of an NK cell or such, to be rejected after a few weeks after lymphodepleting chemotherapy, the safety concerns are different. You mean um, translocations or other modifications that would occur during manufacture? Correct. Ah. Um, well, that too, I think, is a, I mean, I think that is a, a concern, whether it um, exists or not, I think is it needs to be addressed experimentally. Um, and that that is also a separate question from cell state control. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about this later. Yeah, sure. But That's I think fine. the uh, immune interactions, yeah, it's a different issue, but it needs to be oh, I part wouldn't, of it. Yeah, I, it, I, it's, a, it's another one of your variables. Yeah, I wouldn't, right? I wouldn't argue. Although I would say that those immune issues are common to lots of other things, like organ transplantation, as far as that goes. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, I think we really learned a lot. It's me right here. Yeah, so I was right. taken with the two concepts, one that took 83 years for ABO to be discerned, um, and that's sort of like, you know, you know, red blotch on your face kind of thing. <laughs> Given that, um, if you take into concept, the idea that you showed with the adipogenic cells with the antigenic markers, and then you sort of take into concept the concept of multiplicity, that if you had six of those or eight of those or 12 of those, and you could target the product that was made with six or eight or 12 of those to some type of mechanism of action or, or biologic response, isn't that good enough for right now? Well, well that good enough for right now. I'm not quite sure what you mean there. Um, the ultimate idea is, as um, we were discussing a second ago, um, to figure out that relatively tractable uh, handful of um, transduction pathways that need to be interrogated. And the idea is that maybe interrogating them, uh, each one of them, as an on-off will give you a very discreet pattern like looking at a dip switch or the, breaker, the breakers in your basement. Well, if you have a basement, this is California. Um, uh, um, would be enough. And if that can be done, in other words, instead of trying to analyze a whole bunch of different attributes, whether they're CD markers or phosphorylation states or this molecule or that molecule, without understanding what's going on, if you had a solid theoretical foundation for saying, hey, we've identified the attractor state for this desired cell type and that undesired cell type, and you interrogate the sample based on that simplified model, which I think is what Gene was getting at, then that would be all you would need to do. You would not have to do an equiv equivalence testing. We didn't, I did not want to open the can of worms about equivalence testing, but with the statistical criteria of confidence intervals and rejecting the null hypothesis or not, of, is this difference, this analytical difference, that, that's very difficult. And, and it's um, also not well understood by many in the field. If it could be simplified to identifying an attractor state within which, that's why I brought up the concept of design space. If the, the way that the concept of uh, an attractor slots into the ICH concept of design space, to me is compelling. And um, maybe the, the most useful uh, application of the concept of design space. 
And many would argue, I would argue, that uh, if you can do that, well, uh, that should suffice for a, 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 a demonstration of equivalence. That's the idea. I understand that, and thank you. That was very helpful. Um, I guess, in addition to that, you know, we've talked. You've talked a fair bit about signaling, cell signaling, trans, you know, transduction of some type of mechanism of action through the cell. But it's highly plausible that you're looking at two types of cell therapies that are developing. One where a cell goes in and does something, right? And then signal transduction would matter. Um, and then more what uh, Dr. Loring was talking about, which is a gene expression profile of a cell that could then drive biology. For instance, a CAR T is a cell therapy, but what's happening inside that cell matters very little, right? It's what's happening outside of it. So I just think that maybe for the field, we should start thinking about you know, what's happening if you're putting a cell in that you want to last, cells that are built to last versus cells that are going in, delivering some type of mechanism of action and then going away? Well, I think um, similar concepts could apply in both cases, and it would, um, some of that would be case by case, but yes. There's, there's one question on Zoom, because we should probably do that, but it may take longer than just a few minutes to answer. Um, what is the, a lot of what you were talking about, uh, says the question are about uh, off the shelf reagents or cells that exist and some may work and some may not. What about when it's a process to make a product from patient to patient? So I guess it's like an IPS lines or pulling out autologous and then some process needs to be done on those before it goes into the patient. How does the FDA regard those since each, each patient could be its own experiment in some respect? Well, this actually uh, is... But only if it's a short question, a <laughs> short answer. Well, it, it, is, it, it is something that we see and in some, in, in cases that we have encountered, including uh, one or two approved products, the, um, there is a kind of a confusion between a clinical uh, patient inclusion criterion and a uh, uh, manufacturing um, uh, um, uh, starting material acceptance criterion. Uh, and it's the same thing in this case. And there is ver variability in input material that can have um, uh, a profound effect on what comes out of the manufacturing process. And in fact, um, uh, some colleagues have indicated that they can often predict from uh, analytical results from the input material whether the manufacturing campaign will be successful. One potential application of this concept of, of cell populations is that um, well, as you saw from the, 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 uh, uh, the bar graph slide that had the um, MSC preparations, there were, big there were big differences from donor to donor in the fraction of the population. This is with a biological assay that were capable of adipogenesis. So what you might be able to do is identify um, the, uh, sub the subpopulations responsible for the therapeutic heavy lifting ideally mine that subpopulation for surface antigens that could be used to separate them physically. And that's what I was talking about, about dosing. Right. If, you, if you need to dose, just like you know, conventional transfusion medicine now, sometimes if uh, after dose intensive chemotherapy, you don't have enough neutrophils to keep yourself from dying of infection. But now you can pull out neutrophils and give enough of just them. You couldn't do that with whole blood. So that's the analogy, and I think, uh, I think it does apply. Great, so very rigorous release criteria. Okay, I think we, we've run out of time, and uh, I think we, just one, one note that I wanna make, I think it'd be remiss if we didn't uh, note the passing of Ian Wilmot yesterday, who was a major oh. contributor to our field. He died, ironically, of complications from Parkinson's disease, and of course, some of his discoveries are leading to at least cell-based therapies for that. And I want to thank uh, Malcolm for being generous with his time and, and his intellect. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next month.